Good afternoon and welcome to our alumni lunch hour talk on COVID-19, the seventh wave and booster shots. My name is Karen McQuick and I'm the alumni director at MAC. This afternoon, we're delighted to welcome McMaster's own Don Bodish to provide an update and answer your questions. Don is a professor of pathology and molecular medicine and the Canada Research Chair in Aging and Immunity. Her research focuses on understanding how the immune system fights infection in older adults. Just last week, Dawn and her colleague Andrew Costa released a study that Moderna vaccines are better than Pfizer in protecting residents of long-term care homes from COVID-19 Omicron infections. Now let's join Dawn for her talk and I will return later on in the webinar for the question and answer portion. Hello, and thank you so, so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for all of you who registered and sent your wonderful questions. And I'm really happy to be able to share with you the science and, and some give you some answers to what you're looking for. So by far the biggest question was to boost or not to boost. And to understand this, I think it's important that we understand how vaccines work and why we need multiple doses of almost any vaccine to make it work. The immune system, much to your surprise, is actually way better at forgetting things than remembering them and works to actively forget things. This is because if you had an immune response to every food you ate, everything you breathed in, everything you touched, you'd be constantly inflamed and very, very ill. So the immune system is constantly making judgment calls about what to remember and what to forget. When we vaccinate with the first dose, what ends up happening is that response uh, starts the entire process of the immune response. It brings in the correct immune cells. It starts to make some of these antibodies that we've heard so much about in the context of COVID vaccination, but it can be very transient. It can be a very short-term uh, immune response. And in fact, and for many of our vaccines, if for example, we start our vaccination journey, but don't finish them, we have to go back and start that vaccination again, because we are more inclined to forget things if we've only had one dose than if we've had multiple doses. So for virtually every vaccine, you need more than one dose. The second dose is where the magic really starts to happen. At this point, your, some of your immune cells have already had a sense and committed to responding to that vaccine. And so now they're in the right place in the right time. They've gotten a little bit of a signal and they start to really get into action. This is one of the reasons why most people have their strongest reaction. They feel the sickest after that second dose. The immune system massively ramps up very, very quickly and starts to produce antibodies and makes uh, what we call memory T cells and B cells that can help fight the infection. Now, when the vaccines were originally designed, they were designed to get people vaccinated as quickly as possible um, with the knowledge that we might in the future have to reinforce that with a third or possibly more doses. What's happened in reality is the vaccines were made against that ancestral COVID-19 strain, and we've seen a number of mutations that have changed the effectiveness of this. Third doses are generally essential for vaccines to cement that memory, to make sure that the immune system is not going to forget. And what we're now learning is that people who've only had two doses from uh, the original series and are now fighting Omicron, they simply do not have the degree of protection that's required. Two doses doesn't give you both the quantity, the amount of the immune response, and it also doesn't provide the highest quality immune response against Omicron. So three doses is absolutely essential to deal with Omicron. Many of you have had your three doses and now you're asking yourself, what about the fourth dose? Well, let me give you some insights into the data we have and about what the fourth dose is good for and not good for. The there are two basic philosophies to vaccination in the context of this pandemic. The first philosophy is let's vaccinate the people who are the most likely to end up in the hospital or to get severely ill. And by vaccinating those people and hopefully keeping them out of the hospitals and making sure that they don't get severely ill, we'll be able to keep our uh, society running, our healthcare system running. The second philosophy says, let's vaccinate as many people as possible to reduce the number of infections. Now, both these philosophies are useful. Um, 
and both are slightly different. For reasons um, that I'll explain to you, I'm more in favor of the vaccinate to reduce the total burden of infection. And that's partially because I study older adults and people who have immunocompromising conditions. Vaccination only works in the context of a healthy immune system. So having a really robust, healthy immune system helps have a really strong response to the vaccine. You might be surprised to know that older adults are less likely to have those side effects from, from vaccination, including things like the feeling really ill, their arm is even less sore, uh, they might feel less feverish. And that's because the aging immune system is a little bit less responsive to a vaccine. For those of you who have kids, you may remember taking them to the uh, doctors for their vaccine series. And you may remember them being really feverish and clingy and feeling really poorly. That's because their young, healthy immune systems are really responding really strongly. So being an older adult means that you're less likely to have serious side effects or even the mild side effects from a vaccination, but you're also less likely to have the strongest uh, immune response possible. Some fraction of our population, no matter how many times they get vaccinated and no matter which vaccine they use, cannot be fully protected against uh, infections. In the best case scenario, even having a partial response helps a little bit. But for some people, despite their best intentions, they won't be able to be fully protected. Those people need to rely on the rest of us. They need to rely on their healthcare workers, the people they're close to, the people they spend time with uh, to be vaccinated to stop infections coming from them. Although older adults are the ones who are most likely to end up in the hospital or to, to get severely ill, younger people since the very beginning of the pandemic have been the ones most likely to become infected. This is because young people have big social contacts. They go to school, they go to work, uh, they may care for children who we all know are vectors of infection. And so as a consequence, uh, reducing the, in, the number of infections in the population as a whole can help uh, protect those people who can't be fully uh, protected by vaccination. Fourth, doses are a difficult decision for us all to make right now. Um, we know that in the context of Omicron, the period of protection we have from those doses is shrinking and shrinking. We also know that having had an infection with a pre-Omicron variant only provides about three months of protection uh, towards uh, Omicron again. Omicron is what we call an immune evasive va uh, variant of the virus. This means that even if you're vaccinated, it can still infect you. But what those vaccines do is they stop you from getting very seriously ill. So should you get that fourth dose or should you wait? Well, there's a few things to consider. Being up to date on your vaccines means that um, you are less likely to get, uh, the symptoms you get will be shorter, you'll be contagious for a, less, uh, a shorter period of time, less likely to infect your loved ones. It's also important to keep in mind that um, in outside of the acute infection, which can be range from asymptomatic to extremely unpleasant, there are long-term health consequences that are associated with serious respiratory infections in general and with COVID in particular. You may have heard of the syndrome called long COVID, which is when people don't fully recover from the infection and they may develop breathing issues, cognitive issues, fatigue issues. We also know that COVID can damage the heart. And so people who've had COVID have a higher risk of heart attacks, strokes, and other cardiac events in the years that follow. Shortening and minimizing those symptoms mean that you're less likely to develop these long-term health consequences. So moving forward, what we probably need to think about is not how many doses we have not thinking of them as boosters, but thinking how recently we've had them. We can expect that six months is a reasonable amount of time to consider yourself protected from, from at least the current variant of Omicron when you've been vaccinated and three months from infection. So we can start thinking about our periods of protection and sort of 
using our vaccines at the start of a wave to protect us when we are the most likely to become infected. It doesn't make as much sense to get vaccinated in a low point because your chance of being infected is a little bit low, lower than when those waves start creeping up. By vaccinating people and keeping them up to date in those vaccines, we have the option of minimizing or reducing that wave a little bit quicker, minimizing disruptions to our healthcare system. Fourth doses um, are, uh, in my opinion, uh, not a bad idea for people who are um, who are who would like to minimize their risk of getting sick, to minimize their risk of taking time off work, uh, and minimize the symptomology of their symptoms. But we need to keep in mind that there will be more waves coming. We've followed the data from other parts of the world, and we now know that Omicron waves will come and go every three or four months until we get better vaccines. So that brings me to the next question many of you have asked. The question is, What's up with the new vaccine? Are there Omicron specific vaccines? Should I wait till one of these vaccines comes out? Let me explain to you how the next generation vaccine uh, that's currently being reviewed by Health Canada works. It contains a little bit of the original and a little bit of an Omicron specific version of the mRNA and puts them both together. The data that the company has publicly released looks promising, it looks good but it doesn't look pandemic ending good. It doesn't look like this Omicron specific vaccine will be the last vaccine that you will ever get. It does look like it will provide probably a bit more protection against Omicron for a little bit longer. So maybe we'll shorten those waves, make them a little less serious, maybe minimize symptoms or mean that we can be vaccinated a little bit less frequent, frequently. Some of you have asked, why would they include the original version of the, um, uh, of the mRNA in there if we don't even have that virus anymore? And the answer is, it's an insurance policy. All the um, pre-Omicron variants, Delta, Alpha, um, Gamma, that had come to Canada were really, really uh, knocked out by our, our current vaccines. They really worked very, very well against them. And Omicron's a bit of a special case. So by including both of those vaccine into one vaccine, it's sort of future proofing, giving a little boost that we know is already quite effective, but just for a short period of time with Omicron, but very effective against pre-Omicron variants, as well as looking future forward, trying to protect us a little bit from Omicron. I have no insight into the approval of process. I'm not involved in that. However, we do know that by the time these uh, vaccines get approved, uh, by the time they're procured, by the time we would hypothetically be administering them to the priority populations, you know, people in long-term care, the immunocompromised, those are at the highest risk of infection. The fall may not be September, it may be closer to November or December. So what you can use your packet of protection uh, of three to six months by getting vaccinated now. And if you live in the province of Ontario, our chief medical officer has said that being vaccinated now will not preclude you from access to one of those new vaccines should they be approved by Health Canada and made available. Now, the last thing I want to address before we uh, open it up to some of the Q and A's that we have uh, ongoing in the chat right now are a very common question you've asked about um, if I've had COVID, when should I get vaccinated? Let me explain to you how our recommendations work around infections and vaccinations. And let me explain to you why we would make those recommendations. In general, after you have an infection, your antibodies and immune responses are quite high. We know that in the context of Omicron, if you've never been vaccinated, Omicron doesn't induce a very strong response. And in fact, you can get rapidly reinfected with another Omicron variant. If you've been vaccinated and you've got Omicron, you're in a better position. You ramp up that vaccine response, you top it up with a little bit of the Omicron specific response, and you're probably protected from a serious infection for at least three months, but not much longer than that. And generally, we want those immune responses to go down a little bit before we give you another boost. 
because the in general vaccines are most effective when you're not at that peak where you already have a lot of those antibodies. And we also want to think about using your packets of protection. So if you've recently had an Omicron infection, you've got three good months. As I've said, our best guess for how long uh, a vaccine provides that similar protection of uh, time of protection is somewhere between three and six months. So now you've got a three month packet of protection after which you get vaccinated, you get another three to six months, and then you can start thinking about the next vaccine dose. So you wanna spread out those packets of protection and not squish them all into the same time period. Use them to extend that period of protection that you have. Now, if you have ha an immunocompromising condition or if you have some other serious health concerns, your doctor or healthcare provider may recommend that you go ahead and get vaccinated anyhow or pursue some other avenue. Um, obviously, I can't comment on, on, on that. But in general, you wanna wait at least three months after infection and then enjoy that, that, that period of protection you get in the context of the vaccine. We hope that uh, we, there will be other vaccine options for you in the future as well. Um, many of you have asked what we're looking at uh, and what we're trying to develop. We'll show you a slide at the very end of today's webinar about a trial that's ongoing at McMaster using an inhaled vaccine. Some of the inhaled vaccines, as well as some other companies, um, are developing vaccines that they hope will be uh, more broad against more different kinds of coronaviruses and more different kinds of variants. What they do is they target parts of the virus that don't mutate so rapidly, that don't change as quickly, with the hopes that if we keep that immune memory uh, to those parts that don't mutate as rapidly, we'll have an advantage over the virus which is clearly uh, mutating very rapidly and evading some of our current vaccines. So those are some good options for you as well. Now, we have a lot of really great questions in the um, uh, chat, which I'd like to address. And one of them is about looking future forward to this year's flu season. Many of you will remember that the period between 2020 and when we started socializing again was one in which you didn't have a lot of colds or flus. Uh, many patients with respiratory conditions had some of the best years of their lives because they didn't have exacerbations. All the things we were doing, the masking, the social distancing, the uh, socializing in smaller groups had a big effect against other respiratory infections but we're now seeing them return as we return to our uh, mask-free life and we return to socializing. We have not had a very strong influenza year in the last uh, few years, but it is predicted to come back. And it's also going to be a little bit complicated because that stimulation we normally get to our immune system that boosts those pre-existing um, immune responses to influenza hasn't been there for two years. I'll be getting my flu shot and I'd recommend that you do it too this year. People often ask if you should get those together. And the answer is that in the early days of the, um, in the, early days of the uh, vaccine rollout, it was recommended to keep them apart. That wasn't because having two vaccines at once is problematic. It was because we wanted to make sure we really understood which side effects were associated with which vaccine. The current recommendation from the National Advisory Council on Immunization is that we don't need to do that anymore. These vaccines have been studied. We have a very clear sense of what the side effects are. Um, and so if it's more convenient for you, then you can have them uh, together. If you'd like to spread them out by a couple of weeks, that's totally fine as well. Well, that's great, Don. So much great information. And I know we do have a number of questions. So I'm going to fire a couple away at you. But I think one of the most interesting things that you talked about is thinking about is your packet of protection. So we have lots of people, I'm sure you know as well, that I don't know a summer where as many people are getting on planes or going on, you know, trips since we haven't been able to do that for a couple of years. So if I'm trying to think about my packet of protection and I'm going on an airplane um, in September, when should I get my booster shot? Mm -hmm. So your booster takes full effect about two weeks. It takes two weeks for the immune system to ramp up, although, you know, maybe 10 days for younger people, maybe 14 days for older people. So if you have the trip of a lifetime, a wedding you can't miss, you know, something that's been so important to you and you've had to 
getting that booster about two weeks beforehand would give you some additional uh, protection from that as well. I don't want to give the impression that that's the only thing we can do. Obviously, keeping those masks on on a plane is extremely helpful. Um, keeping out all our other good practices that we've had, making sure we're socializing outdoors as much as we're able to. All those things obviously stop you from getting sick, but a vaccine is another tool you can use to make sure you have the, the summer of your dreams. One of um, the questions that we had come in was around vaccines for um, for males under 30. Like, it, is there one you, in particular you'd recommend? Or um, the other part of the question was, I mean, there has been some challenges getting young people to get, in particular, perhaps boosters, their third or even thinking about their fourth booster. So um, how do we convince the younger folks to actually get that done? It's a great question. So the first question about the, one of the reasons we sort of, put Pfizer uh, as the preferential vaccine of choice for the under 30 crowd is because there was, were some side effects associated with myocarditis. Now, what's interesting is most of those side effects seem to come after the second dose, and it seemed to be accelerated or accentuated when we were using those really close um, intervals, three weeks after the first dose, you got the second dose. Canada has done better than many countries because we actually tried to extend that dosing interval. So we had a little bit less of that. And the risk of myocarditis or those side effects seems to go down quite substantially with each additional dose. So the good news is that the risk of those events are lower um, as we move along our vaccine journey, um, but they're still very much on people's mind. Using the Pfizer one at this extended interval is the best you can do. Now, why should young people get vaccinated? Well, I think there's a lot of good reasons. Um, we don't know how many young people might experience long COVID, but we do know some people do. So there is both protecting from the acute infection, keeping their community safe, keeping the young kids in their lives, the little sisters and brothers who are just starting to have access to vaccines now, keeping grandma and grandpa healthy are really important factors. And young people have tremendous power to influence their peer groups. So speaking about your choices about why young people got vaccinated, I'm too old. <laughs> the under 30 crowd is not uh, <laughs> going to be motivated by today's uh, event. But young people have incredible power to counter uh, misinformation on, on social media. So sharing uh, resources um, is actually one of the best ways to get them as a peer group to make the decision to get vaccinated. Well, shifting into young people, my as uh, I mentioned to you before we started, my nephew visited on the weekend. He's 26. He's like, oh, the pandemic's over. I'm like, the pandem's, pandemic's not over, my friend. Um, but I think people don't quite understand the different, like, when does a pandemic move to an endemic? And and how do we how do we get there? Not necessarily that we actually know when we're going to get there, but what what's the difference and, and why is an endemic where we want to end up? Mm -hmm. So an endemic... I think one of the big misunderstandings, an endemic doesn't mean we go back to our old life necessarily. It means we adapt to a new life. So for example, there are parts of the world where malaria is endemic. Malaria still kills a lot of people. It maims a lot of uh, babies born to pregnant women or causes a lot of challenges in that sense. And so if you live somewhere where uh, malaria is endemic, you get bed nets, you take care, you try to prioritize pregnant women to make sure that they're okay. You know, you lose a lot of babies uh, because there's not good treatments. So endemic doesn't mean lack of disease. It means that there's periodic outbreaks of the disease. Parts of the world where HIV is endemic, that doesn't mean you get to go back to uh, having unsafe sex practices. You have to make more decisions about that and you have to invest more resources into testing and treating. Our endemic will be best managed if we start to make adaptations now. Just as we don't accept waterborne diseases, which are endemic, and when we have a lapse in how we take care of waterborne diseases, we have tragedies like Walkerton, where many people were died, died or were permanently maimed by a waterborne disease that got, made them very sick. Moving forward, we need to invest in ventilation. We need to have new and better standards for ventilation so that we have fewer infections. We may need, as an endemic, to periodically put those masks on if healthcare utilization is problematic. We need to change how we do congregate care, or um, uh, we may need vaccine mandates for healthcare workers, just as we do for other infectious disease. So endemic doesn't mean ignoring it and it goes away. Endemic means dealing with it, coping with it, but minimizing the death and disability associated with an infectious disease. 
So there's still a lot of questions around testing and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So we have a question here about what tests can one get to determine if one has got ever gotten COVID-19, especially if it was non-symptomatic -symptom and can, de can tests determine how many times and when one has gotten COVID-19? It's tough. So basically what happens is you look for antibodies in the blood of people and uh, that are that these antibodies are parts of the virus that are not found in the vaccine. Unfortunately, those antibodies aren't quite as long lasting. So some studies say between three and 11 months. And with Omicron, some people don't even develop them properly. So as a consequence, it becomes really hard to know if you've actually had COVID. So uh, some commercial labs are, are um, allowing these. Um, labs like my own look for both T cells and antibodies, but you have to be in a research study. So it's really, really hard to know if you've ever had COVID without having had a PCR test, unfortunately. Um, uh, th this question takes me back to the early days of the pandemic, whenever we were wiping down every surface that we, mm. we, we came across and, and whatnot, which is always a good practice anyways, probably that's why we didn't have so many colds. Mm -hmm. Um, but what is the latest on surface tr transmission? Like, do we, I mean, good hygiene is good hygiene. We should do things, but like, what do we need to do, uh, around that now? You probably don't need to wash your groceries anymore. Uh, so we, fomite transmission was something that we thought was a big problem in the early parts of the pandemic. Fomite means when you touch something and then touch your mouth. So for example, you touch something that somebody's sneezed on and then you get enough virus into your mouth. In the early parts of the pandemic, you had to be infected with, we estimate about a thousand viruses to get sick, which is you know a significant amount. Um, Omicron's more infectious, so it's much less. And because you need lot, uh, much less you can get more of that just by breathing in the air. I tell people to imagine somebody breathing with an Omicron. Imagine you had in your house, you just burnt your toast. So your house is all smoky. Imagine all the work you have to do to make your fire alarm stop going off. You have to open all the windows, you have to fan, you have to open up all the doors and things like that. That's the kind of ventilation you need to remove the virus from the air in your in your immediate vicinity. So almost all the infections um, are now attributable not to things you touch and then touch yourself, but rather the air you breathe. And so we have to really think about that uh, in the context of air ventilation. Think about that smoke in your kitchen and how much work you have to do to ventilate that. And that's the kind of work you'd need to do to make that, that air safe to breathe in the context of Omicron. Um, okay, here's a question that actually relates to um, the study that you and Dr. Costas just mm -hmm. released last week about um, the difference in efficacy for Pfizer and Moderna for older adults. Now you were looking at it in, in the, the long-term care setting, but perhaps you could speak about that, about you know, the difference between the two and what's, what may or may not be the right choice of vaccine? Absolutely. So our study actually did have people from retirement homes and assisted living and long-term care. And in long-term care, we had people as young as 40 and as old as 105. So there's a huge range of responses in there, but universally, irrespective of people's uh, medical conditions or their age and, or their sex, Moderna gave more bang for the immunological buck than Pfizer did. And that's for probably the main reason that there's more of the mRNA in the Moderna vaccine. And as a consequence, there's more of the immune response. We already know that older adults sometimes need a little bit more of a push. So we have a high dose influenza vaccine that puts a little bit more into the vaccine. And so Moderna, I sort of think of as the high dose one. Other groups have shown that people who are immunocompromised or on immunosuppressant drugs or have, or maybe in chemotherapy, uh, therapy for cancer and kidney dialysis, all of those folks seem to respond a little bit better to the Moderna because of the more bang for its buck. So if it's an option for you, I think it's been, it's, it's a really great option. You should have no concerns about mixing and matching. One of the things our studies showed and other groups have shown as well is that um, having even one Moderna in your series gives you a little bit of a bump up and gives you a little bit more protection. So if your next dose could be a Moderna dose, uh, that would be really, really um, uh, give you a little bit of extra protection. Um, but all vaccines are good vaccines. And if you have concerns, you think to yourself, you know what, I had Pfizer, I didn't have a bad reaction, I feel comfortable with that. Any vaccine is a good choice. So we've had a couple of questions around, like one around, I had my third dose in December, I've never had COVID, like, should I get my fourth dose now? And someone who's had the fourth dose, thinking about 
if there's a fifth one, which probably there will be, and there'll probably be a little bit more after that, when, when should one get their fifth, like when would be a time to get the fifth dose? Mm -hmm. So definitely, you know, our study has found and others have found that really pro protection against hospitalization lasts after six months from your third dose or your fourth dose or whatever it is. But your protection against the symptomatic infection starts decreasing. And as time goes on, there is a very real possibility that symptomology will get worse. You'll get sicker. If you get sicker, then there's more chance of developing some of these chronic health issues. So I start to feel uncomfortable at about six months. You know, I start to, I start yeah. to worry about people I care about not being fully protected at six months. Um, the fifth dose will be a good question. We know from other parts of the world that the next Omicron, the B2.75 boo, will probably, as soon as this wave starts receding, start to see an uptake, and about three or four months later, we'll have that next Omicron wave. Best time to get a vaccine is right when that wave's going up, right? Because then you're maximizing that protect packet of protection for the duration of that wave. So I would probably wait unless you had some immunocompromising condition or you're in a high risk occupation, uh, probably best to start thinking about using that packet of protection for that next big wave. So recently in Ontario, they've opened up um, the ability for children, I think it was under five to get a vaccine. And so we know that 12, 11 year olds have had a, a couple of vaccines. Do you anticipate that they'll have to, they can get a booster shot as well, or should they get a booster shot? Yeah, like I said, almost all our childhood vaccines, virtually all of them comes in three or fours. And again, that's really cementing that memory. Really, the problem is with kids, you know, we have an additional, we, we just want to make sure that they're so, so, so protected and so, so, so safe. So it's a little bit unclear uh, right now about if those kids are starting to see lots of breakthrough infections and if those are having any uh, chronic health issues. I suspect to cement that memory, they, their immune systems, as healthy as they are, will eventually forget <laughs> if we don't give them that third or fourth shot. So at some point, we'll definitely start thinking about that. For those kids, though, perhaps it makes more sense to wait until we have an Omicron specific one. Okay, um, a question around, we'll just do, I think uh, we're at half an hour, so we'll do just a few more, but I think we've covered off almost every question that came in pre-submitted pre, um, and um, during the uh, webinar. Does, here's a question, Did, does it, to what extent does a booster age your immune system or does mm. it age your immune system? This is a great question. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the backstory behind this question, forgive me while I, I, I just give you a little bit. There is emerging data that having had COVID damages some of your immune cells, specifically what we call the T cells. So people, especially people who were infected really early on and didn't have the protection of a vaccine, they lost some of their T cells. And in some cases, those didn't seem to come back. And when they did, um, when, when we do look at their T cells, they look a little bit older. There is some concern, growing concern, that this may explain why people who had these infections, especially if they didn't have a vaccine to help them get through it, seem to be getting sicker from all sorts of different things now. So there's higher risk of heart attacks and mental health issues and respiratory issues and other infections. And, and so the data is emerging that there may have been some damage to the immune system. Many people are asking, well, the vaccine response is kind of like the immune response to an infection. So if the infection can do all that damage, can repeat vaccinations do any of this damage? Can it hurt my T cells? Can it cause my immune system to age? There is absolutely no data to support that. The, the difference between an infection and a vaccination is in an infection, the virus is fighting back. It is fighting to kill the immune cells. It is fighting to subvert your immune response to it. A vaccine is a nice safe place for your immune system to do what it does needs to do without having to deal with all that tissue damage and all those other things that happen during an infection. There is no data of that. We are currently doing a study uh, to put people's minds at rest uh, to, to evaluate that. Um, but I can't think in the history of vaccinology of an example where that's occurred. The concern might be that our immune system might get tailored and tailored and tailored to really respond to that Wuhan strain and lose a little bit of flexibility to deal with the new, new um, uh, vaccines. 
but that has not in the, the data for these bivalent vaccines where we have a little bit of the old, a little bit of the new, there's been no evidence of that. So as of right now, I can't pull up any immunological reason why we would be concerned about repeat immune boosting. So you just mentioned the Wuhan strain. And so someone just asked for a little clarification on that is so if Omicron is so immune evasive, can you clarify how a booster vaccine against the Wuhan strain can provide additional protection at this stage? Quantity over quality. So we've got two ways we can deal with this. We can have the perfectly attuned antibody that binds so perfectly to the virus it can't get into us. Or we can have a whole bunch of antibodies that may be imperfect, but absolutely coat that virus in a way it can't get into us. So one of the reasons the vaccines still work, but for a shorter and shorter period of time is because we're, we're protected when our immune response is so sky high that we're relying on quantity over quality. But as this starts to slow down, that's when the Omicron can take over. So until we get to higher quality antibodies that are really specific and we don't need very many of them, we're relying on quantity. So we had a question around um, uh, a husband who let us know that his wife had a mammogram in, let me just go back here, in March and she was asked if, she had received doses of COVID, vac COVID vaccine and said yes, two doses. And they said that COVID and vaccine, vaccine, vaccination had elevated issues with swollen lymph nodes. So she had en indeed has some of these issues and is hesitant to go getting boosters due to this issue. Mm -hmm. Would you still recommend getting a booster? Well, that's a tough one. So I never give medical advice because I'm a PhD scientist, but I will explain the biology of the swollen lymph nodes. So lymph nodes are where the immune action happens. So when you get your injection into your arm, what happens is that vaccine doesn't go into your blood like people think. It goes into your lymphatics, which is this clear liquid, and your lymphatic system is basically your immune system superhighway. They can, they can go real fast up and down, and they head over to the lymph node because that is where all the immune cells hang out. So you're more likely to find one that's going to be the right one to respond to the vaccine. All vaccines work by causing a bit of inflammation. That's why you feel poorly. And inflammation is often associated with swelling of these lymph nodes. And in fact, one of the side effects of vaccines can be people going and getting mammograms because those lymph nodes happen to be found right under your armpits and where some of the breast tissue lies. So it's not at all unusual to see swelling of the lymph nodes and to have people being coming really concerned that that's a lump in their breast as an example. So that's um, uh, in general, the second dose is the one where that's the most likely to happen. So again, I I'm not making any specific medical yep. advice about a perfect case, but in general, that lymph node swelling is the strongest after the second dose and it becomes less pronounced in future doses because the immune cells are already got themselves organized. They don't have to all come into the lymph node uh, to get activated. And maybe we'll end with this one. If I've recently had COVID, should I continue to continue to do the rapid test to see if I'm negative? Like what, what should be our practice on testing now? Yeah, you know, I get really, really frustrated when public health uh, and governments make decisions that are not based on the good data. Our five days of isolation is so problematic, especially with Omicron, uh, because so many people are still infectious after that five days. A good rule of thumb, is two completely negative rapid antigen tests 24 hours apart, and I mean completely, no faint lines, like completely, uh, is generally a pretty good rule of thumb. Most people take a little bit longer than five days to get there. Uh, I, in a perfect world, we'd be able to provide PCR tests, which would give us the definitive answer. But in the absence of that, um, two negative rapid tests 24 hours apart is, is probably the best we can do in the general public. Yeah. And all right, I'll end with this one. So at age 90 and immuno, uh, immune compromised, if I had my fourth dose in January this year, should I get a fifth booster now? So Jan fifth, yeah, so we're about eight months out. I start to feel a little uncomfortable uh, with, yep. with a 90 year old being eight months out. Our data shows that there's pretty significant waning by that time and they might be more vulnerable. And if you're in Ontario, the evidence is we're plateauing, but it might be quite a long plateau with a lot of infections. And I especially worried about my immunocompromised uh, research participants because they need so much medical care. And, you know, that sort of close contact, that medical care is a risk factor for getting infected because there's just so many infections in the healthcare community now. So um, our data suggests that immunity by eight months post uh, is, is waning. Is waning, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So I think I took away from this is the packets of protection. So we need mm -hmm. to actually remember when we got our vaccine and map, map ourselves out on how to do that. That's a really good takeaway. Well, Don, thank you so much for, for um, taking all the questions everybody sent in before and putting together a great presentation with the latest information that will help us as we continue to manage the waves of COVID. I think, um, I think we're all get, getting used to the waves. Maybe one day we won't talk about a wave or the wave will be a little blip. That would be good, mm -hmm. fingers crossed. And really wanna thank you for taking the time to do this. Um, you're a very busy person and doing amazing research at McMaster. And, uh, but this is a, a way for us to tell the, you know, share with our community the, the great research and things that are going on and, and giving us the tips that we need to do if we're gonna get on a plane and we're gonna have a, a, a family gathering in the next few weeks. Well, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for all your great questions. This is our study that's go ongoing at Mac. If you'd like to try an inhaled vaccine um, and be part of this research group, if you could reach out, um, this would be just an amazing opportunity to see uh, our community be involved in this research to develop what I hope will be one of the next generation vaccines. Excellent. So we'll, um, we have recorded this and we'll be sending out um, the recording to everybody who was able to join us and also registered and uh, we'll include information on the, the study for folks as well so that they don't miss that. So thanks everyone. Have a great uh, Tuesday and um, we'll see you soon at our next webinar. Thank you. Bye now.